Today is July 11th, 2017. My name is Teresa Beer Larson, and I am talking with Erwin Kloss, also known as Irv Kloss. May I call you Irv? Irv is better, yeah. <laughs> okay. Do I have your permission to record your face and your voice this morning? Yes, thank you. Great. The first question that I always ask is when and where you were born? Well, I was born in 1935 uh, in a little town of Batchtown, Illinois, which is about uh, 30 miles north of St. Louis, in a line between the Illinois and Mississippi rivers. And uh, it's known as apple country, where they grow a lot of apples. I understand that your father had some sort of hunting and fishing camp, is that right? Oh yes, he was an avid hunter for many years and uh, starting out he, he actually leased uh, a pool, 26, on the Mississippi River from the Corps of Engineers and he would take hunters out to the river to, to hunt ducks. And, uh, and then he bought a place in Missouri, just straight across the river from where we lived. And we moved there when I was 12 years old. So I grew up in Missouri and uh, went to the University of Missouri. How did your father's hunting and fishing camp experience shape you as a child? Oh, I would say very much because, uh, well, I think I, sh I hunted ducks when I was nine years old and uh, shot my first duck when I was 12. And uh, so I spent a lot of time in a duck blind in the early years, uh, not so much in recent years, but I, I ended up studying and researching waterfowl. <laughs> Did you have a relationship with the environment that was collegial, so to speak? <laughs> Well, um, Dad wanted me to go to college, and I went uh, to major and majored in wildlife conservation at the University of Missouri. And uh, one of the things that I think really changed my whole life was uh, reading Aldo Leopold. As a, I was required reading actually as a sophomore, I think, in the class that I was taking. And uh, my advisor turned out to be a man. Um, by the name of Bill Elder, who was married to one of Aldo Leopold's daughters. <laughs> so uh, I had a lot of connections there with uh, Leopold. And uh, so he wrote a land ethic, and so I really accepted that land ethic and tried to live it the rest of my life. We want to get you to Ames, Iowa, and to, uh, to a discussion of Ada Hayden Heritage Park, which is the primary topic for today. Yes. But maybe you can give me the 30-second Irv Kloss <laughs> resume. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, well, I went to graduate school at the University of Kansas and ended up teaching at, at Rockers College in Kansas City for six years. And then I got a job with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and may, moved to Maryland and worked there for four years and then the opportunity came to come to, to Ames to be with the U.S. with the Cooperative Fish and Wildlife Research Unit which Ding Darling started at Iowa State in 1932 and uh, I got the job as assistant leader of that uh, unit and I spent 25 years then here at Iowa State uh, as a member of the faculty, but also as a Fish and Wildlife Service employee. During that time, what kind of networks did you build, not only in the university community, but in Ames and possibly Story County? Who were the people that you met that might later figure in uh, some of your decisions in retirement? <laughs> well, a lot of the people I met were um, faculty members in my department. And uh, one of those was John Downing and, um, and several others. But um, then I also got to know people at the conservation board, the county conservation board here in Ames. And, um, you know, it, I don't know, we, conservationists tend to, to network. <laughs> and so uh, that was really, I think, the way that I was able to get to know a lot of people. And, um, so that, that led to a lot of things. What year did you retire? 
I retired at the end of 1999, December 31st. <laughs> and when did the Ada Hayden issue, well, at then it was called Hallis Quarry, when did that come to your attention? It actually came up in early December of that year. Uh, I was at a conference in Chicago, uh, Mid Midwest Fish and Wildlife Conference it was called, where I usually went with my graduate students to to attend that conference. And when I got back, John Downing called me in his office and he said, uh, uh, do you know what's being planned for Hallett's Quarry? And I said, no. And he said, well, they're going to try to build houses all around it. And he says, we, we can't let that happen. <laughs> and so I said, well, John, how do we do that? And he said, well, I've been in touch with the city and they uh, are concerned about the water quality in the lake because it is an alternative water supply for our drinking water. And um, he explained that to me. And uh, he said, John was an aquatic ecologist and had been a lot of experience. In fact, he came to Iowa State as a full professor because of his experience and training. Uh, and he said, uh, if they allow this development to go around the, this lake, uh, it will probably turn into green pea soup, <laughs> is his exp way of uh, expressing that. Uh, what he meant was that uh, nutrients would be uh, added to the water and it would uh, create algae blooms. And those nutrients would come, for example, from people fertilizing their yards, is yes. that what you mean? Yes, and he said that his experience with urban areas was that uh, the runoff from urban areas was higher in phosphorus than even agricultural lands. And so he predicted that it wouldn't be a, but a matter of years before the lake was contaminated. The fact that there was an adverse weather and climate, I know using those words together is dangerous, uh, in the mid-1970s, the drought, in a strange way, that bad experience was useful in talking about what to do with the quarry. Yes, absolutely. Uh, 1977, uh, the city, we had a very severe drought and the Sunk River went dry. And uh, a hydrologist at Iowa State by the name of Merwin Dougal uh, advised the city that if uh, they needed to keep the water in the Skunk River uh, some way and... Um, because the Skunk River water is going to go down to the aquifer right. and feed the aquifer Berkeley where we got it. Our... We have a shallow aquifer where we get mm -hmm. our drinking water. It's about 110 feet mm -hmm. in glacial till. It's uh, gravel and sand, and so the percolation of that water through the bed of the river was what recharged our aquifers. And when that aquifer started drying up, because of the river's dry, um, the wells, the water in the wells began to go down also. And actually, Ames instituted water rationing that year. And uh, so Merwin Dougal told them if they built a low head dam at River Valley Park and pumped water from the Howitz Quarry into the river, it would recharge the aquifer. And they, so they took a, a bobcat and dozed up a, a dam, covered it with plastic, and uh, began pumping. And everybody gathered down by the river to see the water come down and, and uh, it didn't come at first. So they sent somebody up to look, and it turned out that a beaver had built a dam upstream. <laughs> and so uh, it was holding the water back. So they had to break that dam and allow that water to flow down to where it would recharge. And, uh, and it worked. It, it recharged the, the wells, and uh, we were able to continue to use water, and eventually it rained. <laughs> I guess I was putting those two things together because someone might say, well, Mr. Downing, so what if this little lake around these people's houses has algae? But there were people in official places like the city and people in observation places such as Mr. Downing and yourself who said, wait, if we want the water from Hallett's Quarry to help recharge our city water someday in the event of a drought, 
we need to make sure that the quality is good. Am I putting those two things together? Yeah, we're not so, not so concerned about the quality of the water for drinking, for recharging the aquifer because the, the river provides an ecological service mm -hmm. in filtering that water as well as percolating it down. Okay. And But the thing was that the, the developer said that when he got his development done, he would give the lake to the city as a park. <laughs> Well, he was talking about 75 feet of land around the park, around the lake, and that was it. And so uh, John Downing told the city that if this happens and it goes bad, then the city will be liable for this polluted water. And um, so if you want it for recreation and aesthetic reasons why people live near water, uh, you got to keep it clean. So it was, again, a quality of water issue, but not drinking water. It was the quality of what you could expect if you went to this area to recreate. Right. Okay. Right. So let's, let's go back to 1999. This is where Mr. Downing says, Irv, <laughs> what's <laughs> yes. going to happen here? And just for the record, the, it was the Hubble company from Des Moines that had proposed That's correct. a development. That's correct. And... Just uh, last Sunday's paper had an article about the Hubble development uh, building a downtown uh, development in Des Moines, and the chief executive officer that announced this was Alec Tollickson, and he was the person that came up to essentially give their spiel to the city council about this development he wanted to build. And uh, I remember him very clearly because uh, he was very aggressive and, and uh, fought for his development pretty hard. And, uh, but we organized a group of about uh, 15 people through this network that I, we, we had established and, and uh, all agreed to come to the city council and testify uh, in opposition to that. First we went to the Planning and Zoning Com uh, Commission. And uh, I think we convinced them, I can't remember, but I think they voted to recommend that it not be done. And, uh, and then um, Mr. Tollickson uh, said, we need to have an answer on this from the city council uh, within a couple of weeks because we need to get started, <laughs> which is a typical uh, reaction, I think, from developers. And, and I can understand why. Anyway, um, he, the city had to spe uh, city council had to um, hold a special meeting because they in December they always have their second meeting before Christmas, <laughs> and so they wanted this meeting between New Year's and Christmas, and part of that was a strategy, knowing that this was a college town and a lot of people left town. And so, uh, but they did. They scheduled it for the 28th of December. And uh, so we had to rally our troops again. And John Downing had to go to uh, Minnesota, or did go to Minnesota for Christmas to, with his relatives. And uh, he drove back to testify at that meeting. He's a very key person because he had the expertise and the data to show that this was important. And uh, so that's where, uh, that's how we did it. And we had our, by that time, mobilized several other people. I don't remember just how many people testified, but it was a pretty good group. And um, we convinced the city council to not annex the property, which was the next step that would have happened. And uh, Were you worried at all about the vote? Oh, yes. Uh, <laughs> We were very nervous, um, but uh, I, I think the final vote was uh, four to one, so it was a pretty, and, and one, at, one council member was absent, so it was, you know, that was another thing that we had to, to deal with. Uh, the mayor at the time, Ted Tedesco, what was his position on this? Oh, Ted was very much, I think, on our side. <laughs> uh, Ted, it was actually, I think, uh, Ted was responsible for helping us uh, uh, save, the, save that lake. and Why was he passionate about it? Oh, he's an avid fisherman, for one thing, and he saw that as a uh, 
place where uh, people would really enjoy fishing, and uh, I think that was part of it. But he also has a, a strong um, affinity for environment, and uh, in fact, he eventually became uh, a member of the county, Sorry County Conservation Board. And, uh, Do you think he might have fished in Hallett's Quarry? <laughs> there actually is a lot of fish in Hallett's Quarry, in Hallett's Quarry at that time. In fact, um, uh, Clay Pierce, and uh, he's a fisheries biologist at Iowa State, part of our co-op unit actually, and he did some scuba diving out there and, and with a camera, an underwater camera, and took pictures of fish. And uh, these fish mainly got into the lake from the river during flood times. And uh, so it was known that there was some big fish in there. <laughs> and uh, I think a lot of people went there. And in fact, recently, there was a, a fish that Clay had photographed called a buffalo. And it's a, a, called a rough fish. It's not one that's sport fishing. but. Somebody caught an 18-pound buffalo out there just the last couple of weeks. <laughs> and then uh, the DNR has been interested in establishing an urban fishery, and uh, they do this in several places in the state, and so they stock trout in the lake. And um, that's kind of an interesting story in itself because trout prefer cold water, and that lake has cold water. And very because it's so deep. But during the summer, it heats up on the surface and it forms a narrow band of what we call a thermocline between the warm and the cold water below. And, it, and that deprives that cold water from any kind of, from oxygen. So it's low in oxygen. And uh, so the trout have to live in that upper layer because of the oxygen in the water. And uh, they, uh, um, the DNR stocks it in the wintertime for ice fishing mainly, and that's been very popular. <laughs> but they didn't expect the trout to live through the summer because of that warm water. But they found that a few do. Hmm. So. Well, I'm going to go back to 1999 for just a second on our okay. political timeline here. So um, the Hubble Development Company did not get the vote from the city council that it desired. So that which to annex. But that gives them the opportunity to go to the county to see what's going on. What happened there? They did. They went to the county and proposed this, and uh, proposed a county-level development. And the county turned them down also because of environmental reasons, knowing that this was a drinking water backup and and other reasons. So the county turned them down and so uh, then they entered into negotiations with the city uh, for the city to purchase the land because they had invested quite a bit in that. And, uh, but at a kind of a compromise, the city allowed them to keep 24 acres on the north side of town within the city next to the park and they developed uh, what's called the reserve. It's 24 um, houses there. But that's more up on the bluff, so to speak, yes, up on the hill. Yes, it's high ground. Right. The city had negotiations, but the price tag probably was going to require a bond issue. Do I recall this correctly? Yes. Um, first of all, the city uh, hired a, um, a company um, let's see, it's called the, um, I can't think of the name, but a Chicago firm that had started up, a non-profit actually, uh, to draw up a master plan for the area. And the head of that, the president of that company was Jim Patchett. And Jim had grown up in this area, had gone to Iowa State and worked for the Story County Conservation Board for a couple of years before he went on his own. and. Uh, so he came and helped the city develop a master plan for the for a park, which included buying some more land in addition to the Hallett Quarry uh, land. And uh, so 
The city then applied for a grant from a program that the state had initiated then called the Iowa Vision Program. And they got one and a half million promised mm -hmm. to them from there. But we still needed to raise about five million dollars for the development of the park. And, uh, and that required a bond issue. And Ted Tedesco uh, contacted me and he says, the city can't do this. We've got to have private citizens do it. So would you co-chair a, a bond issue campaign? And uh, I had no experience with that sort of thing to start with, but um, the co-chair was Kay Berger, who lived right next to the park and very much uh, in favor of a park. And we... Uh, called a meeting of about 25 people at City Hall, and, uh, and, and it was amazing, the turnout, a big, a big turnout, and we sat around at a big table, and uh, by the time the meeting was over, everybody had a job. Now, uh, you have passion, I hear passion in it, you have people, you've got people. You still need to have some funds for a bond issue. Did you have to raise some money just oh, in yes, for the so advertising? Oh, we raised some money, and... Uh, just from private donations. We didn't go out and solicit them even. They just came in. Was it, was it a $5,000, $6,000, $7,000 uh, campaign? I can't remember. I think it was around 5000 mm -hmm. because, uh, well, we went to, we, we had yard signs and uh, lots of them, and we went to, uh, uh, gave talks at Kiwanis Club and the Rotary Club and Garden Club, just about every group we could think of. Uh, to tell them what this bond issue was all about. Now, I know it was a November vote. How much time did you have in anticipation of that roughly um, to get out your message? About three months. About three months, yeah, okay. It was a good, ample time. And uh, it, it, you know, we had to get 60% of the vote. That was required by law for a bond issue. And uh, there was a lot of discussion as to whether or not this would pass. And so we worked hard at it, and... Uh, if I could, if I may, you said there was a lot of discussion if it would pass. What did you perceive to be the uh, group of people or the philosophy or who is in opposition? Um, we didn't know who was in opposition, but we expected that uh, there would be. I went to, for another reason, I went to see... Um, uh, Ev Cochran's son, who was running the Cochran de Development Program, and they had purchased 250 acres on the west side of the park, to the west of Grant Avenue. And uh, he said, oh, this will never pass. And I said, well, I think it will. And then the phone rang, and he got on the phone with a banker, he told me afterwards. And he asked this banker on the other end, you think this is going to pass? And the banker says, yep, it'll pass. <laughs> and so he convinced him, and uh, so then uh, he was, I guess, just agreeable that, you know, this, this might be a good idea. And uh, Did but, you perceive any other resistance when you were knocking on doors and making phone calls and putting out Signs. No, not so much uh, against the idea, but it was against, well, it'll raise my taxes a little bit. And we explained that this was not a great amount. It would be, I think, uh, less than $10 on a on thousand value. And so we, uh, we pushed the idea of the uh, drinking water backup and, uh, as an alternative water supply, and then also the uh, recreation. I remember telling people that when I moved here in 1975 that the realtor, uh, Glenn Lohman was the realtor that we were talking to at that time, and, and Glenn says, well, that's going to be a park someday. And he was trying to sell me a house up there on top of Hollow Road close to the park. <laughs> and uh, so I had always had the idea that this was going to be a park. Well, apparently other people did too. Yeah. And I think there, was, there were undercurrents in different parts of the city. I think there were Parks and Rec people that might have thought about it, but there wasn't the critical mass right. 
uh, until 1999. And it's, it's sort of interesting that it took an outside proposal to sort of coalesce some of the various people and groups that might have been interested in making it yeah, a park. Yeah, I think so. And uh, Jim Patchett did a great job of developing the master plan uh, that called for a park that was not uh, highly developed, that it was a passive recreational with, with bikeways and paths for hiking and for enjoying the, the wildlife and so on. So uh, That would speak to you, wouldn't it? Yes, uh, definitely. And Jim held uh, listening sessions from the community, several of them, and uh, got this idea that this was a good idea. And uh, so that's, and then we had the idea that, actually this started with the Hubble development actually, because uh, they tried to uh, um, show the city that they could develop it without causing a problem to the water quality. And so they called in a, a company out of uh, Minneapolis, Bonastro was the name of it, and they suggested putting in the wetlands on the west side to intercept surface water coming in and that that would essentially help keep the water quality high. And so uh, that was a good idea, <laughs> but uh, it didn't uh, take away the, the idea that we needed a park. And so uh, we, the wetlands were put in once the park was developed, and so we, we took that information and used it. <laughs> you always can glean information from everybody, even the people that maybe you are opposed to it, that they're exactly. opposed to their philosophy exactly. at some time. Yeah. When you were doing the door knocking and you were canvassing for this, at what point did you think it might pass? <laughs> well, that was kind of, uh, I don't, I don't know. It was, uh, we got a lot of good positive uh, comments from door knocking, but um, I think the final, the day before the election, uh, we had organized uh, with the help of, by the way, Herman Kornbach, who was on city council at that mm -hmm. time, and he was a very um, good strategist, and he, he said we need, he got a hold of the voter list for the city, and uh, we called people on the phone the night before to make sure they voted. Getting out the vote, it's called. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think you had some help from an attorney here in town? Who... Yes. Uh, in fact, uh, one of the owners of part of the, that sold the land, some of the land to the city in addition to the whole uh, land was Clark Paisley. And Clark uh, uh, offered his law firm with number of phones, and that's where we used, we had about seven or eight people calling and uh, from his office. And, uh, <laughs> and when we started these calls, we got almost positive vibes from everybody. And that's kind of when we thought we had it. Mm -hmm. uh, did you celebrate? Oh yeah, we had a big party afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> you gonna tell me about that? <laughs> um, well, it was at Kay Berger's house, actually, and uh, the campaign committee met out there, and, and uh, somebody had got the idea that uh, we should hand out uh, awards to people, and so several of us got, got plaques that, <laughs> that were uh, congratulating us on that, so that was fun. Were they genuine or were they in fun? Uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I've still got mine. It's, uh, it's kind of cool. Okay. Was there anything that happened in the campaign that made you laugh? Something funny? Somebody that you, you ran into that you went... Oh, I have to think a little bit. Um, yeah, I think uh, there were lots of interesting things happened, um, particularly when we went around and talked to the Rotary Club and the and on. They, they came up with ideas and one of the things that I thought was a funny uh, 
episode was one of the at one of the testimonies that we had before council on that 28th of December. Uh, they had named the this development as a uh, uh, harbor. Uh, yeah, Grand Harbor because mm -hmm. it was on Grand Avenue, okay. and they were going to put a lighthouse out there on the peninsula that we called it. And Reggie Greenlaw, who lives in town, um, he uh, grew up. His family, some of them, were lighthouse keepers in New England. And so he asked uh, the developer at that public meeting if he could be the head of the uh, of the, of the White House <laughs> and live in it, and and that brought a lot of laughter. <laughs> and actually, there is a um, private landowner on the west side of the park, mm -hmm. on the other west of Grand Avenue, that bought 40 acres and built a house, and he has a lighthouse in it. <laughs> so the lighthouse image persists. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he and his wife were both uh, reporters or like lighthouses and, uh, <laughs> and like to visit them. So they, uh, as I understand it, uh, Leroy Sturgis is his name, and uh, I understand he bought a light from a lighthouse in Australia on eBay and brought it here <laughs> to put in the house. <laughs> and, uh, so any of you kayakers getting lost out there in the fog? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> you, you can head for his lighthouse. Huh? <laughs> yeah, there's lots of things like that happen. We had some, uh, immediately after the park was established, after the city bought it and had developed it, um, all the land became more valuable next to it. Mm -hmm. And so er, almost all of it, well, it, it did. They bought, were purchased by developers to build houses. And uh, they, uh, they were, uh, first of all, they had to be annexed by the city. And the city council had, in their land use policy plan, had determined that growth towards the south and southwest was the more efficient direction to grow the city. And the, to go north, in that direction where the park was, was secondary in their land use policy plan. So they, uh, they resisted a little bit of the developers uh, on that uh, because they didn't want to go north. And yet they uh, actually let them do that afterwards. They changed their zoning and uh, so they began to develop. And uh, I looked at this from the standpoint of what it would do to the water quality. And uh, what was happening was that the land that had been bought by developers, and Ev Cochran, by the way, was the first one, which they, and uh, he, uh, they rented out to farmers because they don't, can't start development right away, and rented out to farmers, and they were practicing agriculture, grow, grow crop agriculture on this land without any conservation, no buffer strips, nothing. They were just essentially using the land um, to meet their rents and so on. And we, I, I determined that if we develop the land as a low impact development in which stormwater is infiltrated and uh, it kept on the land as much as possible, and it could be done, I was, Actually, by that time, the Solon Water District Commissioner, and we were holding workshops on urban development that would have conservation measures put in. And uh, I said, to advise the city council, I said, if you develop this as a low-impact development, sometimes called a conservation development, although there's, there's a technical differences between the two, um, you it would be better than what the agriculture that's being practiced right now. And so um, I actually supported the idea of development, <laughs> which was, uh, you know... A little flip. Well, or, 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 or shall I just say, amending your point of view. Right, yeah. right. And uh, so that's what happened. And uh, the city actually put an overlay zoning ordinance on that land to require any future development to be done in a low-impact way. 
and uh, and that's what's happening. So low impact uh, not only meant how you would treat the water on your land and how you would handle any sort of fertilizers, but it also meant fewer houses because the Hubble development, correct me if I'm wrong, 1,500? 1,500, 1,500. Right. Yeah. And I'm not sure how close to the lake it would have been, but there's certainly not 1,500 homes <laughs> out there now. No, uh, it's close, but it's a lot bigger area yeah. than what Hubble would have developed. Yeah. And uh, we, uh, I think that the way that low impact development uh, goes is that you have smaller lots and you set aside 30 to 40 percent of the land to treat the water. And it's usually with prairie and wetlands. Mm -hmm. And that captures that water and then infiltrates it down. And, and it also calls for retention basins and that sort of thing. And, uh, and it, it's been successful. In fact, um, Jim Patchett, again, had been involved with a, a uh, development in Chicago area called Prairie Crossings. It became very famous uh, around the country for its design of mm -hmm. using prairies and wetlands to treat water. And they found out that people would build on small lots. Uh, and in fact, some million dollar homes were built on small lots. And there was no reason why you had to have a huge lot in a development like that because you bordered on, on green space. And people like that. In fact, uh, they found that uh, the professional golf or the U.S. Golf Association has found that people buy houses on golf carts, golf courses, even though they don't golf. Sixty percent of the people living on golf courses don't don't golf, <laughs> and uh, it's because of that backing up to green space. Green space. Mm -hmm. The I'm um, backing to my political timeline. So the bond issue passed in November. It was almost five million. You get the grant from, I think it was from Vision, Iowa. Mm -hmm. Story County gives you some money. Uh, they in kind. They, in kind. They in kind landscaping. To plant prairie and, and right. help with some of that, yeah. So um, when did the name Ada Hayden Heritage <laughs> Park come up? Here we have Hallis Quarry. Not very Right. Romantic sounding. So, the city council um, invited people to uh, suggest names, and so they gathered uh, a lot of, I don't know how, dozens probably of different names, and um, one of the strongest. We I remember there were two proposals. We the, the group that I represented uh, had worked with was wanted to call it the Conservation Heritage Park. And um, Deb Lewis at the university, who was a botanist and in the department where Ada Hayden had been, Ada Hayden grew up on a little farm that is now part of the park. Mm -hmm. Just south of the lake. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, she had been the first woman to get a Ph.D. from Iowa State University in 1909 as a botanist. And... Uh, so then she spent most of all of her career at Iowa State as a faculty member. And she was very instrumental in saving lots of prairie land in the state. Um, and so they, Deb and her group made a very strong case for Ada Hayden. And uh, so we compromised. <laughs> now, it was the Parks and Rec decision. It wasn't your decision or anybody else's. It was the city's decision. The city council. Yeah, City Council, yeah, yeah. They had to make that decision. And so uh, we called it the Ada Hayden Heritage Park, which uh, heritage is there for two reasons that were heritage. One is we're trying to restore uh, heritage ecosystems for the state, you know, representations of uh, prairie and wetlands and savanna and woodland on the area. And uh, the other reason heritage is, is important is because we it planned early on to honor um, historical figures who had been important in conservation in the state of Iowa. And these included people like Alva Leopold and Ding Darling and, and uh, 
Lewis Pamel. Mm -hmm. Pamel Road here in Ames mm -hmm. is named after. Um, let's see, Boamel Schemick, um, mm -hmm. John Madsen, who grew up here in Ames and established himself as an important writer and conservationist. And one person who I think little known is John Lacey. And John Lacey was a, a Republican congressman from southeast Iowa in the Keokuk area, had been elected in the late 1800s, and in 1906 uh, he wrote a, a, a bill called the Antiquities Act, which uh, was passed by Congress in 1906 and Theodore Roosevelt was president at the time, and he used that Antiquities Act, which empowered him to set aside land as national monuments. And some of the first ones included the Grand Canyon, which then became a national park eventually. But he used that to set aside land for, you know, uh, to preserve important areas for the, for the, state, uh, for the nation. Mm -hmm. And um, so Lacey was important that way, and uh, we, he's got a, we, we did this by placing stones uh, around the park and had ins uh, inscriptions on them with the figure. We did it through the Nevada Monument Company, actually, that makes tombstones for, <laughs> for cemeteries, but uh, they did a very good job in helping us do that. A park needs to be maintained. Uh, the character of the park needs to be sustained. Uh, what's happening on that front? And, and improved and res restored. Because <laughs> most of the area had been really heavily impacted by the mining operation and by agriculture uh, to the west. In fact, the city added four parcels of land to that that was owned by Hallett's Quarry. Um, and so we have in order to have these ecosystems that I mentioned, we had essentially reconstruct them, rebuild them, and uh, that's what's happened. The wetlands that were dug for water quality purposes uh, provide lots of habitat now for wetland species. And uh, the city just recently led a uh, contract to seed with Prairie, the upland area that has been in hay fields uh, mm -hmm. all these years. And then on the south, we're doing work with Savannah, which is a um, an ecosystem that is probably one of the most endangered in the in the Midwest, in which uh, scattered trees with prairie underneath of it. Didn't I see some goats out there? We, we've uh, we've got <laughs> goats out there, and uh, in order to control honeysuckle, and uh, we're hoping it'll work. Uh, we had trouble getting uh, fire through there because of lack of of enough fuel and uh, it just and would stay wet for a long period of time. So we've, uh, and, and by the way, I've, uh, in 2010, we organized the Friends of Ada Hayden Park. And uh, the Friends group now has gradually gotten enough money that we can help the city with some of those projects. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we paid for the goats <laughs> this year. And, uh, <laughs> because the, the private uh, group called Goats on the Go is a local uh, person and farmers who uh, provide the goats. And they're in the business of helping people manage land with, uh, with the goats grazing. Grazing was an important aspect of before European settlement uh, at, to maintain the prairie and the savannas. And uh, grazing probably by bison and elk, but uh, goats do help their job. <laughs> the question that I always ask at the end of a chat uh, is, is there anything that you'd like to tell me about that I've forgotten to ask or would reflect on our topic? Uh, our topic, of course, today was the transition from Hallett's Quarry, which was an industrial, um, important mm -hmm. function mm -hmm. in uh, Story County, that transition from that, from when it was no longer a quarry, to being the Ada Hayda Heritage Park. So is there anything else you'd like to tell me about that transition, uh, about the passion involved, about who was involved, uh, that I have not thought to ask you? Well, I think it, um, there were a lot of people involved in that 
particularly the bond issue campaign. I would say, you know, I t mentioned 25 people, and there probably were more that got involved as we went along. And uh, <clears throat> that was that was the thing. It was a community project, and uh, not, not anybody individually. And um, I think uh, uh, my co-chair Kay Berger and uh, Ted Tedesco need to be recognized as being very important to that. And Parks and Rec, uh, I think Nancy Carroll was chair at the time and her director, and uh, she was a little bit, I'd say, I, not reluctant, but they had enough on their plate that they didn't want to take on another big park at first. But when she saw the value that was there, she did. She got behind it pretty strongly. Uh, the other thing is that one of the things that we've been interested in doing with uh, the Friends Group is to document the changes in the flora and fauna <laughs> that that are, occur when changes occur. I mean, the habitat is changing. And so we did a, a study in 2002, before the park was even a park, to find out what was there. And then we've been documenting those changes over time. And uh, I would say uh, about three or four of us have been sampling uh, the fauna, uh, birds, mammals, reptiles, amphibians, uh, dragonflies, uh, butterflies, all those things are important, and the plants. So uh, because we planted prairie and, you know, new birds come in and and Wolf Osterreich uh, has been very important to that. He's Is there something remarkable about that change you'd like to share? Something that was surprising? <laughs> well, there's been uh, a lot of animals, I think, come in um, that we have not expected from the standpoint, particularly birds. And that's I, maybe they were there and would stop by, but uh, we've attracted lots of uh, waterfowl in the wintertime for over winter. Uh, geese and ducks, and in migration we get lots of stoppage. In fact, it's, one, it's the largest deep water lake in the county, and we've had rare birds show up there uh, on migrations. Uh, things like uh, yellow-billed loons, for instance, and common loons, and uh, various kinds of ducks. Mm. Uh, I think Wolf has got the database for the birds, and he's recorded over 260 species. So it's a pretty large list. And, uh, they, you know, some of those have only been seen once. Like sandhill cranes are not common in this area, but they do once in a but while. But they stop straight. by. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, we're hopeful that someday they might winter. And, and we're getting trumpeter swans, which uh, have come in the winter time. But it's possible that a pair might stay and nest on one of the wetlands that we have. And uh, we're hopeful. And then he and I got together, have been documenting the dragonflies and damselflies, which is in the, the insect order Udinata. And uh, there are 115 species of dragonflies and damselflies in the state of Iowa that have been documented. And uh, we have found 55 of the species at Hayden Park. So that's a, a big... Uh, and that would be because of the grasses and the water... Right. That, that lo and, right. and the wetlands. And the wetlands. Yep. yep. And uh, so we're seeing some neat changes. Yeah. What do you think your dad would think <laughs> of Ada Hayden Heritage Park? Well, I think he would be... Uh, very much uh, appreciative of that park, and he would probably be out there roaming around on it if he was here. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that, that's something that um, we try to make available to uh, older people to experience. And one of the, re one of the ways that uh, the Friends Group is last year we rented three large golf carts that hold six people. And we rented three of those and notified the assisted living area uh, companies here in 
Ames and said, invited them to come out. And they, it was so popular, we're going to do it again this year. Excellent. <laughs> Park for all people. That's right. Because they don't get to walk. Uh, in fact, I've now become kind of uh, infirm in my, <laughs> my legs and I don't, can't walk as far. But uh, in order to experience the park, you've got to get out there. And mm -hmm. since we've essentially banned rules say that there's no motorized vehicles, we have to get special dispensation to use those golf carts. <laughs> but uh, the cities are willing to do that, and they think it's a good idea. It's a good idea all the way around. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you for your input. Thank you for sharing how you got interested <laughs> and why you got interested and uh, how you worked on that passion. Okay. Thank you, Teresa. Thank, Thank you. you.